Live from Austin, Texas, it's theCUBE. Covering KubeCon and CloudNativeCon 2017. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Linux Foundation, and theCUBE's ecosystem partners. Okay, welcome back everyone. Live here in Austin, Texas, is theCUBE's exclusive coverage of the CNCF Cloud Native Con, which is yesterday and today is KubeCon for Kubernetes Conference and a little bit tomorrow as well, some sessions. Our next guest is Adrian Cockcroft, VP of Cloud Architecture Strategy at AWS Amazon Web Services and my co-host Stu Miniman, obviously Adrian, uh, industry legend on, on Twitter and the industry, formerly with Netflix, knows a lot about AWS now, EP Cloud Architecture, thanks for joining us. Appreciate thanks, it. Sarah. This is nice your first time here. as an AWS employee on theCUBE. Yeah, you've been, been verified. on theCUBE before. <laughs> <laughs> Many yeah. times. You've been verified. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what's going on now with you guys, obviously coming off a hugely successful reInvent, there's a ton of video of me ranting and raving about how you guys are winning and there's no second place. Um, in the rear view mirror, certainly Amazon's doing great. But Cloud Native's got the formula here. This is a cultural shift. Yep. What, what is going on here that's similar to what you guys are doing architecturally? Why are you guys here? Are you evangelizing? Are you recruiting? Are you proposing anything? What's the story? Yeah, it's really all of those things. We're, we've been doing Cloud Native for a long time and um, we, you know, the, really, the key thing with AWS, we always listen to our customers and go wherever they take us. Right? That's a big piece of the way we've always managed to keep on top of everything. And in this case, um, you know, the whole container industry, you know, there's a whole market there, a lot of different pieces. We've been working on that for a long time. We found more and more people uh, interested in CNCF and Kubernetes and really started to engage. Um, Part of my role is to host the open source team that does outbound engagement with all the different open source communities. So I've hired a few people. I had Arun Gupta, who's very active in CNCF um, earlier this year, and, and we're, internally we were looking, hey, we need to join CNCF at some point. Right? Yeah. We got to do that eventually, and eventually went, let's go make it happen. So last summer, we just did all the internal paperwork and running around talking to people and got everyone on the same page, yeah. and then in August, we announced, hey, we're joining. We got that done. I'm on the board of CNCF. Arun's uh, my alternate for the board and technical, running around and really keep deeply involved in as much of the technology yeah, yeah. and everything. And, and then that was largely so that we could kind of get our contributions from engineering on a, on a clear footing, right? We, we were starting to contribute to Kubernetes we, like as an outsider to, to the whole thing. So I was like, what, what's going on here? So, Getting that in place was like the basis for getting the contributions in place. We start hiring, we get the teams in place, and then getting our ducks in a row, if you like. And then last week at reInvent, we announced uh, EKS, the, uh, the Kubernetes, EC2 Kubernetes service. Um, and this week, we're, you know, we all had to be here. It's like last week after reInvent, everyone at AWS wants to go and sleep for a week. But <laughs> we're like, no, we're going to go to Austin. We're going to do this. So we have about 20 people here. And um, came in, uh, I did a little keynote yesterday. Uh, I can talk through the different topics there. But fundamentally, we wanted to be here where we've got the engineering teams here. We've got the you know, ma engineering managers. They're, they're in full on hiring mode because we've got, we've got the basic teams in place, but there's a lot more we want to do. And we're just going out and uh, engaging, really getting to know the customers in detail. So that's really what drives it. Customer interactions, a little bit of hiring, and just being being present in, in this community. Yeah. Adrian, you're, you're very well known in the open source community, mm -hmm. you know, everything that you've done. Netflix, when you're on the VC side, you, you've evangelized a bunch of it, if I can use the term. Um, Amazon, we, we, many of us from the outside looked and trying to understand. Obviously, Amazon used lots of open source. Amazon participated in a number of source. I mean, uh, MXNet got a lot of attention. Join the CNCF is something. Uh, I, I know this community, it, it's been very positively achieved. Everybody's been waiting for it. What can you tell us about how Amazon, how do they think about open source? Is that something that fits into the strategy or is it a tactic? Obviously, you, you're building out your teams. That, that sends certain signals to the market, but you know, can, can you help clarify for those of us that have been watching you know, what, what Amazon thinks about when it comes to this space. I, I think we've, we've been, so and we didn't really have a team focused on outbound communication of what we were doing in open source until I started building this team a year ago. I think that was the missing link. We were actually doing a lot more than most people realized. And I th I'd summarize it as saying we're, we were doing more than most people expected, but less than we probably could have been. 
at, given the scale of what we are, the scale of the AWS is at. So um, part of what we're doing is unlocking some internal demand where engineering teams were going, we'd like to open source something, we don't know how to engage with the communities, we're trying to build trust with these communities, and I've had a team of you know, several people now who are mostly from the open source community. We're at OzCon, like interviewing people like crazy. <laughs> that, was, that was our sourcing for this team, right? So we get these people in, and then we kind of say, all right, we have somebody that, that understands how to build these communities, how to respond, how to engage with the open source communities. It's a little different to a, a standard customer, enterprise, startup. You know, those are different entities that you'd want to relate to. But from a customer point of view, and being customer obsessed as AWS is, how do we get AWS to listen to an open source community and work with them yeah. and meet all their concerns? So we've been, I think, doing a, a better job of that now. We've pretty much got the team in place. I mean, your, your point is customer focus is the, is the ethos there. Mm -hmm. The communities are your customers in this case. Yeah. So you're formalizing team, it. Yeah. You're formalizing that for Amazon, mm -hmm. which has been so busy building out and contributing here and there. So it sounds like there was a lot of activity going on within AWS. Just, it was just kind of like contributing, but so much work on building out cloud. Well, there was you, a lot going on, but if no yeah. one was out there telling the story, didn't know about yeah. it. I mean, we've been, so the, actually one of the best analogies we have for the EC, for EKS is actually our um, EMR, our Hadoop service, which launched you know, 2010 or something, 2009, we've had it forever. But from the first few years when we did EMR, it was actually a fork. We kept just sort of building our own version of it to do things, but about three or four years ago, we started upstreaming everything, and it's a completely clean, upstreamed version of all the Hadoop and all the related projects. So, but you make one API call and a cluster appears, right? Here, give me a Hadoop cluster, boom. And I want Spark and I want all these other things on it. And we're basically taking Kubernetes, very similar. We're, we're going to reduce that to a single API call, a cluster appears, and it's a fully upstreamed experience, right? So that's, you know, in terms of an engineering relationship to open source, we've already got a pretty good success story that we, nobody yeah. really knew about and it, we're following a very similar pattern. Yeah, a Adrian, can you help us kind of unpack the Amazon Kubernetes stack a little bit? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the announcements had a lot of attention, definitely got, got our attention, Fargate mm -hmm. kind of sits underneath uh, what Kubernetes is doing. Uh, my understanding, you, where are you sitting with the service meshes? Kind of bring us through the you know, Amazon stack. Yeah. What does Amazon do on its own versus you know, the open source and you know, how, how those all fit together? Yeah, um, so everyone knows Amazon is a place where you can get virtual machines. That's EC2, give me a virtual machine from 10 years ago. Everyone gets that, right? And then about three years ago, I think it was three years ago, we announced Lambda. Two or three years ago? I lose track of how many <laughs> reinvents ago it was. But what Lambda is like, well, here's just give me a function, right? But as a first class entity, there's an API, give me a function, here's the code I want you to run. Uh, we've now added two new ways that you can deploy to, two things you can deploy to. One of them is bare metal, which is another announcement. One of the many, many, many announcements last week that you might have like slipped by without you noticing. We have bare metal as a service. Yeah, people go, oh, those machines are really big. Yes, of course they're really big. And you get the whole machine and you can do, but bring your own virtualization or run whatever you want. But you could launch, you could run Kubernetes on that if you want to. We don't really care what you run it on, but. Um, so we have bare metal and then we have container. So, uh, Fargate is container as a first class entity that you deploy to. So here's my, here's my container registry, point you at it, and run one of these for me, right? And you don't have to think about deploying the underlying machines it's running on. You don't have to think about what version of Linux it is. You have to build an AMI, all of the agents and fussing around. And you can get it in much smaller chunks. So you can say you get you know, a CPU and half a gig of RAM and have that as just a con small container so it becomes much more granular for, and you can get a, a broader range of mixes. A lot of our instances are sort of powers of two of a ratio of uh, CPU to memory. And with Fargate, you can ask for a much broader ratio. So you have more CPU, less memory, and go back the other way as well, because we can mix it up more easily at the container level. So it gives you a lot more flexibility, and if you buy into this, basically you'll be able to do a lot of cost reduction for the sort of smaller scale things that you're running, maybe test environments, you could shrink them down to just the containers and not have a lot of wasted space where you're trying to, you have too many container, too many instances running that you want to put it in. So that's, so it's partly 
the finer grain giving you more, more um, you know, ability to save more money. More consumption choice. Yeah, and we've also, the other thing that we did recently was move to per second billing. You know, after the first minute, it's per second. So the, gr the granularity of cloud is now getting to be extremely <laughs> fine grain. And Lambda is per 100 milliseconds, so it's just a little bit. Four dollars and three cents for your bill. Yeah. I mean, this is the key thing. I mean, you guys have simplified the consumption experience. You've got bare metal, mm -hmm. VMs, mm -hmm. containers, mm -hmm. and um, functions. functions. Yeah. I mean, pick, pick one. Pick one. Or yeah. pick all of them. Yeah. I don't, it's fine. <laughs> Adrian, is and, 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 and when you look at um, the way Fargate's deployed in ECS, it's a mixture. You don't do, it's not all one or all the other. You deploy a number of instances with your, with your containers on them, plus Fargate to deploy some additional containers that maybe didn't fit those instances. Like maybe you've got a fleet of GPU enhanced machines, but you want to run a bit of logic around it, some other containers in the same in, in execution environment, but these don't need to be on the GPU. That kind of thing, you can mix it up. Um, so the, the other part of the question was, so how does this play into Kubernetes? And the discussions have just started. We had to release the thing yeah. first, and then we can start talking, okay, how does this fit? And it sort of, it, it, parts of the model fit into Kubernetes, parts don't. So we have to expose some more functionality in Fargate for this to make sense, because we've got a really minimal initial release right now, and we're going to expose it and add some more features. And then we possibly have to look at ways that we mutate Kubernetes a little bit for it to fit. So the initial EKS release won't include Fargate, because we're just trying to get it out based on what everyone knows today. It's, it's, we'd, we'd rather get that out earlier, and then but we'll be doing development work in the meantime, so a subsequent release will have done the integration work, which will happen in public in discussion with the community, and we'll, we'll have a debate about, okay, this is the features Fargate needs to properly integrate into uh, Kubernetes, and there are other similar services from other you know, cloud providers that want to integrate to the same API. So it's all going to be done as a public development um, of how so we So I saw a tweet here, I want to get your comments on it from your keynote. Um, someone retweeted, managing over 100,000 clusters on ECS, hashtag Fargate, integrated into ECS, you know, your hashtag open, ADF is open. Um, what is that 100,000 number? Is that the total number? Is that an example on, on uh, Elastic Container Service, what, um, is, what does that number mean? So ECS is a very large scale, uh, multi-tenant container operation service that mm -hmm. we've had for several years. It's in, it's in production. It's, um, if you compare it to Kubernetes, it's running much larger clusters and it's been running at production grade for longer. Yeah. So it's a little bit more robust and secure and all those kinds of things. I think it's, it's missing some, some Kubernetes features and there's a few places where we want to uh, bring in capabilities from Kubernetes and make ECS a better experience for people. It's, think of Kubernetes as somewhat optimized for the developer experience and ECS more for the operations experience in which we're trying to blink, bring all this together. But yeah, it, it is operating uh, over 100,000 um, clusters of, you know. Containers. Of containers, over 100,000 okay. clusters. And uh, I think the other number was Hundreds of millions of um, new containers are launched every week, or something like that. Yeah. I think it was per hundreds of millions a week. So it's a it's a very large scale system that is already deployed, um, and we're running some extremely large custom on it, like Expedia yeah. and Macbox, Macbox, um, Macbox, um, who are yeah. You know, and some of these people, of some data. of these people are running te tens of thousands of containers in production as a single. We have single clusters in the tens of thousands, right? So it's a different beast, right? Um, and it meets a certain need, and we're going to evolve it forwards. And Kubernetes is is solving a very different purpose. I mean, it's just, if you look at our data science space, if you want exactly the same Hadoop thing, you can get that on prem. You can get you can run EMR, mm -hmm. but we have Athena. And, mm -hmm. and Redshift and all these other ways that are more native to the way we think where we can go iterate and build something very specific to yeah. AWS. So you blend these two together and depends what you're trying to achieve. Well Adrian, congratulations on a great opportunity. I think the world is excited to have mm -hmm. you in your role to you clarify and, and just put us the narrative around what's actually happening at AWS, what's been happening, and mm -hmm. what you guys are going to do forward. I'll give you the last minute to uh, let folks know what your job is, what your objective is, what you're looking for to hire, and your philosophy in the open source for AWS. Yeah, I think the, there's a couple of other projects. We've talked, this is really all about containers. Um, 
the other two key project areas that we've been looking at are uh, deep learning frameworks. It's all of the deep learning frameworks are open source. In fact, a lot of Kubernetes people are using it to run GPUs and do, do that kind of stuff. So uh, Apache MXNet is another focus for my team. Uh, we've been, it became incubated, went into the incubation phase last January. We're walking it through, helping it on its way. It's something where we're 30, 40% of that project is AWS contributions. We're not dominating it, but we're one of its main sponsors. And we're working with other companies. There's um, joint work with, it, it's lots of open source projects around here. We're working with Microsoft on Gluon. We're working with Facebook and Microsoft on Onyx, which is the an open neural network exchange. There's a whole lot of things going on here, and um, I have somebody on my team who hasn't started yet, I can't tell you who it is, but they're, they're starting pretty soon, who's going to be focusing on that open source, deep learning AI space. Yeah. And the, the, the final area I think is interesting is uh, IoT, serverless, edge, that whole space. Um, one announcement recently is FreeRTOS. So again, we we sort of acquired the founder of this thing, the free real-time operating system. Everything you have probably, you probably personally own hundreds of instances of this without knowing it. <laughs> it's in everything. Just about every little thing that sits there that runs itself, every light bulb probably in your house that has, has a processor in it, you know, those are all free out of us. So wow. it's incredibly pervasive and we did an open source announcement last week where we switched its license to be a pure MIT license to be more friendly for the community that, and announced an Amazon version of it with better Amazon integration, but also some upgrades to the open yeah. source version. So again, we're, we're pushing an open source um, platform strategy in the embedded and IoT space as well. Enabling people to build great software, mm -hmm. take the software engineering hassle out for the application developers, yeah while giving the software engineers more engineering opportunities to uh, create some good stuff. Yep. Thanks for okay. uh, coming on theCUBE and congratulations on your uh, continued success and looking forward to following up on the Amazon Web Services, open source um, collaboration, contribution, and of course innovations. The Cube doing its part here with its open source content, three, day, three days of coverage of Cloud Native Con and KubeCon. It's our second day. I'm John Furrow with Stu Miniman. We'll be back with more live coverage in Austin, Texas after this short break. Thank you.